Good morning. Um, not as famous as Dr. So I have to <laughs> one of these days. All right, so uh, by introduction, I am a pain medicine specialist uh, trained up in Boston. Uh, and I now work as a pain medicine specialist here at, uh, in Rhode Island and uh, also teach at Brown Medical School. Um, this is a standard disclosure. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we talk in pain medicine is completely out of the box, completely. It's off-label. I mean, it's really not in any textbook, seriously. Um, <coughs> the problem is that we are here to connect the dots, as Barbara pointed out. And what is the connection? We have EDS, we have dysautonomia, POTS, autonomic neuropathy, migraines, CRPS, mast cell activation disorder. And we need to figure out what's going on with these patients. It's not as simple as saying it's a connective tissue disorder. Is something else going on? Is the link autoimmune? Is it genetic? Is it gastrointestinal? Um, <clears throat> we'll, this is what we are supposed to kind of figure out today. Um, this is my, I'm not a very science sciencey guy, but this is what I did, my little old science thing. It's my science project. So I took Ellers Danlos and I took complex regional pain syndrome, which I treat a lot. Um, pain is 100% in both of them. Syncope or presyncope is about 78 to 40%. Mitochondrial, I don't know. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome is pretty significant in patients with CRPS. Autonomic neuropathy, small fiber neuropathy, mast cell activation, migraines, Raynaud's, and fatigue are present in both. So I don't even know what else I can add in this list. There's a ton of things that can be added. <clears throat> so we look at all this. We'll, hopefully, we'll study this today and figure out if there's any connection. Um, I'm here to talk about complex regional pain syndrome. The reason I, we're talking about this is because it's a very common presentation. In, not, not very common, but it is common in kids. And we were, going to see, we were seeing a link between patients with EDS and CRPS. Um, so it's a chicken and egg. Did CRPS come first or did the EDS come first? I tend to think it's the culprit is EDS. <coughs> um, complex regional pain syndrome, formerly known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, is characterized by severe continuous pain disproportionate to the usual course of any trauma or lesion. Um, it's fairly common, uh, even though it's classified as a rare disease, uh, we see by a very conservative estimate in the United States, 50,000 new cases every year. I suspect it's much more than that. <coughs> Signs and symptoms of RSD, uh, the pain can start in any limb. It can even start in the axial skeleton. Uh, it is a constant severe pain, present 24 hours, even at rest. Um, it's, it's described as a burning, tearing, shooting pain. Uh, there are temperature changes, there are color changes, there's swelling, uh, and the area of the pain is usually much larger than the site of injury. There's limited range of motion. Um, there's no condition that can actually explain that. Uh, there's pain to touch, which is known as allodynia, hyperalgesia, increased pain to mild stimulus, and then there's nail growth changes, hair growth changes, skin changes, skin lesions. We don't know. <coughs> this is a patient of mine. Uh, you can see the color change to both feet. There's a temperature change also. Uh, this is a pa patient with bilateral CRPS. There's color change there. There's severe allodynia to both arms. This one is four, hour, four years after surgery to this toe over here. The temperature is 88 degrees. The temperature to this foot is 94 degrees. You can see clear swelling on this side. Um, again, you can see swelling over here. You can see the color difference between the two. Nail changes. These are nails. Nails grow rapidly. Either they'll grow rapidly or they go slower. They may be brittle. Uh, they're distorted. Uh, skin lesions, they come up with skin lesions. Uh, these are small skin lesions. You can get major skin lesions. Dystonias, dystonias are pretty common in this condition. Um, this is to show you hair growth. Look at the difference in the hair in two legs. Um, <coughs> so hair can grow faster, it's coarser, it's darker. Um, this is an extreme case of RSD. Um, it's actually one of my patients. And you can see blisters. Um, and Amazingly enough, they have done uh, studies on these blisters, and they find a high level of cytokines there. 
So what's the risk factor? It's obviously trauma, uh, this immobilization. So if anyone has a fracture, you put in a cast, and if they continue to complain of pain, suspect RSD. Um, for some reason, it's ACE inhibitors, patients on ACE inhibitors. History of migraines, especially migraines with asthma, uh, sorry, migraines with aura, um, is, is four times more common in women. Um, we're not quite sure about the genetic correlation between in patients or families with RSD. There are families with RSD. We're not quite sure what the genetic correlation is. The diagnos best diagnostic tool is to get a good history and a physical exam. Uh, I usually suggest doing two physical exams to come up because the fleeting nature of the condition, the temperature change, the color change is very fleeting and you may not see it on the first exam. Uh, there are really no good tests that you can diagnose RSD with. Um, people do talk about using bone scan, but it's a very non-specific uh, study. Um, it may help in making the diagnosis or confirming some of the elements of the diagnosis, but it does not rule out RSD. There are no blood tests, skin biopsy, sympathetic nerve tests, EMGs, none of them. They can help rule out other conditions, but can't make a diagnosis of RSD. The only thing you can do is a physical exam and a good history. This is a concept in pain medicine that not only just applies to RSD, it applies to all chronic pain, back pain, post-surgical pain, uh, any chronic pain. Uh, it's called central sensitization. <clears throat> central sensitization is described as a, an abnormal response to normal inputs to the central nervous system. So if I were to touch my finger and if I feel severe pain, it's, it's a kind of a central sensitization. The increased excitability is due to a barrage of signals from the peripheral nociceptors. So we have these receptors in our skin, and there's a barrage of pain signals. So when somebody develops RSD or develops chronic pain, there's, there's this unrelenting barrage of pain signals that are traveling up into the central nervous system, which we know is the brain and the spinal cord. This barrage alters the strength of the synaptic connection between the neurons in the spinal cord. So these are the interneurons and neurons that go up to the central nervous system. What happens is that low threshold neurons that are activated by light touch to the skin now activate neurons that respond to noxious stimulus. So a light touch now becomes painful. So <clears throat> the, the point I'm trying to bring over here is that in patients with chronic neuropathic pain or RSD, the pain is no longer in the periphery. It's no longer, it's now centralized. It's an abnormal sensory processing in the central nervous system. Glia, this is, a, this, is a, this is a cell, this is the new frontier in understanding disease. Anywhere from chronic pain to Alzheimer's, dementia, name it. <coughs> glia, just to recap, are, constitute about 70 to 80% of the cells in the central nervous system. The rest of them are neurons. We believe that glia, their job is immune surveillance under basal conditions. So under basal conditions, they are really not doing anything. They're just kind of janitors to the central nervous system, cleaning it up, making sure everything is going fine. But when activated, can release pro-inflammatory cytokines. These pro-inflammatory cytokines in turn cause neuroinflammation because each nerve in each neuron in the central nervous system is packed with glia around it. So any activation of these glial cells causes them to release these cytokines that cause these nerves to get inflamed. So in, essentially, it is our understanding of chronic pain is now no more neural signaling. It is more a cellular mechanism. So it's not the nerves, it's not the wires. It's the cells in the central nervous system that are misbehaving at this point. NMDA receptors, uh, Dr. Henderson has alluded to that a few times. Uh, what we did notice that in, pa in patients where you have chronic neuropathic pain, uh, these glial cells, are in the, they, there's a proliferation of NMDA receptors. There's, these receptors, they proliferate, uh, they become more sensitive, and <clears throat> so, that's, so that's, a, that's one of the reasons we think is a response of the body to uh, glial cell activation. Can you remind us what NMDA stands for? Oh. It stands for N-methyl D-aspartate, NMDA receptors. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So 
what activates glial cells? It's the usual trauma, the infection, the ischemia, neurodegeneration, but what I want to stress is it's not a one-time thing. It's not, if I, if I run and if I trip, I cut my knee, I bruise my knee, my glial cells will not get activated. It's only if I have chronic pain that these glial cells get activated. There has to be a consistent barrage of signals traveling into the central nervous system. <clears throat> so they looked at glial cell attenuators. What if we could suppress these glial cells? What if we could stop them from being de deactivated? Uh, it does work. It does work well. We don't really have great glial cell deactivators at this time. One of the drugs that they, we looked at, well, they looked at was minocycline. Minocycline is a tetracycline. It does cross the blood-brain barrier, and it has some glial cell modulating effect. Propentophylline is used mostly in animals. Uh, it has a neuroprotective action. IBD blast is, is, a, is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's used a lot in um, Asia and in South Korea. They use this a lot for asthma and stroke, uh, post-stroke dizziness. Um, IBD blast has been shown to be a good glial cell deactivator. So we're still trying to look at it as a potential drug for neuropathic pain or chronic pain. So how do you, uh, so understanding what's the basic principles and what's going on behind chronic pain or chronic neuropathic pain where you have central sensitization, how do you manage this pain? <clears throat> Start the treatment right away. If you suspect, even if you suspect it's RSD, and I, I think we should translate that to even neuropathic pain. If you suspect it is neuropathic pain, if you suspect it's RSD, start the treatment right away. <coughs> and obviously, as in <coughs> all chronic pain, the treatment should be dire directed towards restoring function. We, we talk about pain scores. We talk about 8 or 9. We talk about 4 or 10. It doesn't make sense. It's function. I could be functioning with 8 or 10 pain, and there may be someone who's, who can't function with 4 or 10 pain. And if your pain is 4 or 10 and you can't function, we need to treat that. If your pain is 8 or 10 and you can function, we may not need to be as aggressive with that. Obviously, a multidisciplinary approach, which is literally impossible to get hold of. Sympathetic nerve blocks, uh, they do not work. Why? Because the pain is no longer in the periphery. It's not a neuronal condition. It's a cellular condition. I've done nerve blocks for years. They don't work. I've looked at the literature. There is no literature that says nerve blocks work. In fact, I think they're dangerous. <clears throat> so moving on. This is something that uh, is not well uh, talked about in medicine, is that are the toll-like receptors, are the TLR4. There are a whole, there's a whole family of toll-like receptors. Um, <clears throat> these are expressed by microglia. And under neuroinflammatory conditions, these TLR4s are upregulated. Um, we're not quite sure the role of TLR4s in RSD. But it's been, we do know that there is some key role that they play in glial activation. The reason I bring this up is because opioids cause glial cell activation by acting on these TLR4 receptors. So we are, when, you, when we prescribe opioids, chronic opioids, for chronic pain, we are actually activating these glial, uh, these, we are upregulating these TLR4 receptors, which is causing the glial cells to get activated. So in a sense, we are actually doing harm. What if you do the opposite? What if you give them opioid antagonists like naloxone, naltrexone? We block TLR4 signaling. So really, there are no great long-term studies with using opioids for chronic pain. Uh, on the contrary, they are counterproductive for CRPS. There's a, there's a term that's being thrown out a lot called opioid hyperalgesia. And I believe that it's coming from this. We are actually promoting central sensitization by prescribing large doses of opioids. Short-term acute pain, I'm fine with that. Post-operative pain, I'm fine with that. When it comes to long-term pain, I worry about that. <clears throat> so opioid-induced activation of glia induces them to release neuro, neuro, neuroexcitatory pro-inflammatory cytokines, which again suppresses opioid al analgesia. Um, we looked at other drugs uh, that are out there for, help, for chronic neuropathic pain. We know, you all know about gabapentin and pregabalin. 
Um, there's some, again, gabapentin and pregabalin work in the initial stages when the, when the neuropathic pain or RSD is still at the neuronal stage. It's before it becomes chronic. Sure, try gabapentin, try pregabalin. Pregabalin is uh, Lyrica, Gabap uh, gabapentin is Neurontin. I usually go up to 900 milligrams as my first landing, and then I try to go up to 1800. If they are seeing a response, fine. Uh, the problem is it's a very slow-acting drug. You don't even know if it's helping or not. These are patients in acute severe pain. You want, to, you want a drug that works fast because you don't want those glial cells getting deactivated because of the constant barrage of pain signals. Pregabalin is a good choice. It's a faster-acting drug. Literally, you get to see a result within a week if it's making a difference. Clonidine <coughs> is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Um, it, it blocks the release of, pre of catecholamines. Very effective in um, allodynia, pain to touch. Uh, it's also very good for sleep. Trans you can get it as a pill. You can get it as a transdermal. I believe a transdermal works much better. It's great for hyperalgesia and allodynia. This is a group of drugs that I've been really interested in the last few, uh, in the last year or so at free radical scavengers. Um, and one of them is dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO. DMSO is used in veterinary medicine a lot for treating pain in horses, and uh, it's used in, in medicine, in, in human beings also as a, as a topical. Um, there is good literature, there is good definite literature that came out from Netherlands, actually. Um, in, the Dutch have done an amazing job with studying neuropathic pain and RSD. They basically got over 100 different specialists together, put a ton of money into it, they researched it, and they came up and looked at the literature, and one of their recommendations was, believe it or not, DMS of 50%. Um, it's great for warm CRPS. So in the initial, usually you'll see a warm CRPS in the initial stages, and then it, later on it becomes <coughs> cold CRPS, or the limb becomes colder. My suggestion is to <coughs> try it, even if it's cold, try it for three months. If it helps, move on, keep going on. If it doesn't, um, move on to the next. N-acetylcysteine, or commonly known as NAC, uh, it's a drug that's used for um, cystic fibrosis and acetaminophen poisoning. Um, it's a good free radical scavenger. I've had some really good results with this for cold allodynia. It's an amazing drug. It's a, it's a gastric irritant. Um, it tastes awful. It comes as a liquid, tastes terrible. Um, you can get the pharmacy to make it into a capsule, uh, but it's really a good drug to try. Now, the question is, if it works for cold limbs in RSD, do you think it'll work for cold limbs in neuropathic pain? Probably. What's the harm in trying it? Alpha lipoic acid, or ALA, is another one. It's shown some really promising results in diabetic neuropathy and other polyneuropathies. I haven't seen any trials in CRPS. I've started using it over the last few months, um, so, I, so the jury's still out on that. Um, uh, all these drugs, the DMSO, the N-acetylcysteine, and alpha lipoic acid are actually considered as um, over-the-counter herbals, so you don't need a prescription. Antidepressants, we all know that Famous tricyclic antidepressants, uh, especially amitriptyline, nortriptyline. Uh, in low doses, they do work well. Uh, I like this group of drugs is because the tricyclics is because there is some central action over there. There is some central mechanism. Doesn't work on the glial cells, but there is some central action. In the early stages, it can help. Um, the better drug among this is the SNRIs, which, so I want to explain to you the action of SNRIs. SNRIs are drugs that they increase the level of norepinephrine in the central nervous system. Um, <clears throat> what happens is, if I stick a pin in my finger, as my pain signal travels up my spinal cord into my brain, this there are modulating signals that travel down the central nervous system as the pain signal is traveling up to lower the noise. I, that's the best way to describe it, is to lower the strength of that signal, the pain signal, lower the noise of that pain signal. And the drug, the chemical that does it is, is norepinephrine. So why not use an SNRI, which increases central uh, norepinephrine levels? The difference between these two drugs is melaciprine and duloxetine is, um, melaciprine increases norepinephrine levels by three times than duloxetine. So it's my 
favorite drug to use for, uh, again, these are in the initial stages. And it might be part of the polypharmacy because in RSD, remember, the pain input is still there. There is some neuronal signaling still going on. So these are, this is a good drug to use. Melaciprine is Savella, S-A-V-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Duloxetine is um, Cymbalta. <coughs> NMDA or N-methyl, N-methyl D aspartate receptors. Um, so like I said, when these glial cells get activated, there are these NMDA receptors, they, they proliferate and they become even more sensitive. So why not try a drug that can actually block these receptors? Unfortunately, we do not have drugs that block these NMDA receptors for long. They're all temporary. Ketamine is one of them, dextromethorphan, which is a compound of a common cough, uh, robitussin DM, memantine. Um, dextromethorphan and memantine are very weak uh, NMDA receptor blockers. Ketamine is a powerful NMDA receptor blocker. So what if I can give a patient with RSD some ketamine and I can block these NMDA receptors, I may be able to deactivate these glial cells. Um, it's just to clarify, uh, ketamine is, a, is one of the safest anesthetic drugs that can be used. Um, it actually stimulates the nervous system. It's a very powerful analgesic. Unfortunately, the oral absorption is very poor. So it's only effective given IV or uh, submucosal. <coughs> you can, um, so there have been studies done that have shown that if, what if we gave patients with neuropathic pain and RSD sub-anesthetic doses of NMD of ketamine, what would happen? And, and the, results have, this, the results have been pretty good. Uh, rough estimates show that 85% show improvement in daily activities, reduction in their medications, and improved lifestyles. The only problem is that it's not a cure. It does not block the NMD receptors for good. One, number two, you still have the pain from the periphery, That's, the barrage of signals are still there. Your glial cells are still being activated. Um, does it deactivate the glial cells? We're not sure. <clears throat> so ketamine infusions have to be combined with other therapies. There are several protocols. Uh, there's the low-dose protocol. Uh, it can be done as an outpatient, infused over four hours, uh, repeat the next day, next day, next day, and till about 10 days to start with, and then they may need boosters. Um, and then there's the inpatient protocol where you admit the patient to the ICU and give them ketamine over the next few days. Um, basically blocking the NMDA receptors, blocking the glial cell, de uh, glial cell activation. Spinal cord stimulators, uh, it's an electrode that's inserted into the spine uh, percutaneously. Uh, we don't exactly know what the mechanism of action is. It's, some people believe it's because of a, it's like a TENS unit. It's painful, it's expensive. The results are poor. 25 to 50% of patients develop complications requiring further surgery. but What's also interesting is that <clears throat> in a huge study, spinal cord stimulators reduced pain and improved quality of life, but did not improve function for up to two years after implantation. And then after three years, it was the same as those who did not have a spinal cord stimulator implanted. So it's only good for about two, three years, that's it. <clears throat> but the risk of putting one is really high. This is my favorite drug, and I wanted to bring this to you. Um, Low-dose naltrexone. So we know that naltrexone is a competitive antagonist of opioid receptors. It's been around for 30 years. It was um, it's used for, it was initially uh, approved for heroin addiction and alcohol addiction. Over the years, they found out that when you take it in a really small dose, in a really tiny dose, it can help patients with severe neuropathic pain. And I'll get into why, how, what are the theories that behind it which it works. The first theory is that it's a low dose. And when I, mean, when I say low dose, I mean we're talking a normal dose of naltrexone for a drug addict or an alcohol addict is about 150 milligrams a day. We are talking four and a half milligrams over here, once a day. So that's a really low dose. So the theory is that it transiently blocks the opioid receptors. When it transiently blocks the opioid receptors, it causes a, bio, a feedback mechanism causing the body to release more endorphins. That's one of the theories. The other theory is that, which is a little more recent, is that it increases the production of something called an OGF, opioid growth factor. 
it increases the number and density of the op opioid growth factors, which intermittently block the opioid receptor. <clears throat> also, the OGF has also been looked at re repairing tissue and healing. The other one is it also blocks the activity of TLR4. So the dose can be anywhere from 1.75 to 4.5 milligrams. It may cause some insomnia in the initial stages, mild headaches. Um, it's also, patients do report some really colorful, crazy dreams. Uh, obviously, you can give it to anyone with, uh, who's on opioids. Uh, it does increase physical activity. It, it, it's great for, it, it reduces the number of flare-ups. It's not a cure, but it reduces the number of flare-ups. So over here, like I said, you, I'm not a science guy, so I've got to tell you about my experience. I've been using it for over three years in my patients with uh, EDS, with CRPS, and we've seen some amazing results come out. So in EDS, I did question my patients. I said, look, does it help with the pain or what is it doing to you? And they said, the exact word was, they feel more put together. I think Ellen can vouch for that. They feel they can, they have a higher exercise tolerance. They can do much more. So functionally, it does help them. I have no idea how it works. <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is a young lady with, uh, she has EDS and she also has RSD. Um, she was basically treated with just LDN. This is post-surgical, but you can see the difference. Um, I can safely say that she does not have RSD anymore. And she was treated mostly on LDN. We did not do any infusions on her. This is the patient, uh, uh, a gentleman with um, severe RSD. Uh, and you can see skin uh, color changes, there's swelling, there's ulceration, there's all sorts of nasty things going on. This is him uh, a few months ago. He was on IV ketamine infusions and low-dose naltrexone. He's now walking, the ulcerations have gone. He still has some color change, but very functional. Non-steroidals, uh, ibuprofens, uh, they have no role in this. Maybe if you have joint pain, topical NSAIDs do work well for that, if, you, if it's from a superficial joint. Exercise and physical therapy is key. So an ideal combination of treating a patient with neuropathic pain or RSD is, is maybe ketamine infusions, low-dose naltrexone, and boot camp exercise. These are the three things. And that goes for EDS patients. Um, I, I tell patients with EDS and RSD, I said, this is your fourth meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and exercise. It has to be every single day. Um, so we know that RSD decreases function, uh, it decreases mobility of the joints, it affects the joints also, the muscles, it affects everything, it's painful. So there's decreased mobility. Decreased mobility leads to uh, muscle atrophy and deconditioning of the muscles. <coughs> Physical therapy and exercise is not to relieve pain. We, patients have to be very clear about that. In fact, physical therapy in the initial stages may actually worsen the pain. It's basically to restore function and learn how to use your limbs properly. These are the two goals of treating patients through exercise and physical therapy. There are two types uh, in exercise. There's a pain-focused. This is the more recently diagnosed uh, neuropathic or chronic pain patients where you you can go up to the pain level, and then you, you exercise to your pain level, and you, then you drop down. Um, they may have increased pain for a couple of hours after exercise, but then they start to show some improvement. Time-based is in more chronic pain patients where you're avoiding deconditioning of the muscles. Uh, medications, this is a drug, um, again, it's called <coughs> PEA, or palmitoyl ethanol amide. I finally get that. It's an endogenous lipid. It used to be available in, the Euro in Europe for many years. Uh, we now have it in the US. Uh, it's over the counter. Uh, you have to go to a compounding pharmacy for this. There have been some really good studies to show that it works for neuropathic pain. No specific studies on RSD, uh, but it does work well on neuropathic pain. Neurotropin is, a, is, is widely used in actually Japan and Australia to treat neuropathic pain. Uh, it's, uh, it's, they, they vaccinate these rabbits and make, make this extract from them. Uh, there have been 24 clinical studies to show that there's a 50% response to treating allodynia and hyperalgesia. Unfortunately, we do not have it in the US. 
Biphosphonates are the group of drugs that are used to treat uh, osteoporosis and osteopenia. Uh, Clodronate and alendronate uh, have been shown to have very good results in treating uh, RSD patients. Right now, it's just reserved for refractory cases. Uh, try getting insurance to approve it. <laughs> Vitamin C has me baffled. Um, there were two studies that came out recently where uh, they took these patients with uh, Coley's fracture, which is an arm fracture, and they divided them into two groups. They gave one group vitamin C the day they had the fracture and gave it for a month and a half. And there was the other group where they, they did not give them any um, vitamin C. And there was a significant drop in the amount of, in the incidence of CRPS in these patients. There was some, there was another study done with ankle fractures along the same lines. So the question is, we have some idea that vitamin C somehow prevents RSD. Not sure how. The question is, can we use it for established cases of RSD? Can we use it for neuropathic pain patients? I don't know. Is there any harm to giving vitamin C? There's a little debate, but I think for a month and a half, it's reasonable to try, it on, try them on vitamin C. I will usually prescribe vitamin C to patients who have RSD or neuropathic pain. They're undergoing a surgical procedure or they had a trauma, they slipped and fell or something, which EDSers do a lot. So I, I tell them, just start vitamin C right away, 500 milligrams a day for a month and a half. Muscle relaxants usually don't have any significant role in treating uh, dystonias. They don't have any role in treating uh, muscle spasms. They really just lower the tone of the muscle. Uh, but it's reasonable to try it. If it helps, fine, stay on it. If it doesn't help, uh, move on. They do have significant side effects. Uh, they do cause lethargy, sleepiness. Uh, complications of RSD. So RSD, like EDS, can affect any organ. There's poor processing. So starting from the brain, there's it, this poor um, processing. There's poor executive function. There's lethargy, tiredness, weakness. And that's not related to the pain. It's just they have this lethargy. Um, they present with syncope. They do present with dysautonomia and POTS. Uh, they present with chest wall dystonias, so they come in with chest pains. Uh, we have edema. Uh, we're not quite sure. It's, it's neurogenic or inflammatory. Um, they have increased sweating. The, the official figure is 30 percent. I think it's much higher than that. Um, <clears throat> they do have unexplained bruising, and it's not related to the site of the pain. So if somebody might have RSD in their right foot, may have increased bruising on their left arm. Um, they have bladder problems. They have GI problems. Gastroparesis is really common in this group of patients. Dysautonomia, uh, we all know dysautonomia. It's postural. Uh, po one of the, it's an umbrella condition for a bunch of uh, cardiac, uh, neurocardiac conditions. Uh, one of them being the popular one is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. These patients do not really present with syncope. They present with what is called presyncope. They're like about to faint, but they don't faint. But there's a significant raise, a rise in their heart rate. It's more than uh, 30 beats per minute from changing posture when they stand up. A very simple test is an orthostatic. Have, take, a, take a blood pressure and pulse rate reading when they're lying down. Have them stand up for 10 minutes. Take a blood pressure and pulse rate reading. You should not see a significant change in the blood pressure, but you'll see a significant change in, the, in their heart rate. A tilt table test, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty gruesome test if you have dysautonomia. So just to uh, recap, we know CRPS is a chronic neuropathic pain. It starts in one of the peripheries, but it can start in the axial skeleton. You can have RSE starting in your belly. You can have RSE starting in your chest, even back. Um, it rapidly moves from the periphery to cause central sensitization, becomes a more central condition. No real good test to diagnose it, except doing a good history and physical exam. <coughs> uh, we think that a lot of this central sensitization is from glial cell activation, which cause release of cytokines that cause neuroinflammation. Uh, drugs that can deactivate these glial cells, uh, some of the ones we talked about are uh, IBD blast. I'm not sure if LDN does that. Uh, but the key thing to remember is start treatment right away. Do not wait. Um, and multidisciplinary approach works best. Avoid opioids. It's a nightmare if I get patients I'm usually the end of the line. I get patients on massive doses of opioids, and it is causing glial cell activation. I can't get them off them because that's the only drug that's giving them any benefit at this point. Um, 
So I'll try an algorithm where I'll put them on IV ketamine, uh, and then I'll start them having tapering off the opioids. Once they're off the opioids, I, boom, start the low-dose naltrexone and see what happens. Definitely don't go for nerve blocks. It's, there's no literature to support it. Physical therapy is definitely a yes on that. Uh, start it right away before they get into deconditioning. Other drugs to try are PEA. Um, it's marketed as P-Pure. Uh, there, 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 there are compounding pharmacies that market it in the US now. Uh, vitamin C, start that. Uh, avoid any trauma or surgery. Excuse me. The more trauma you cause. So let's say somebody comes in with RSD and you start a peripheral IV on the left arm. You've just caused some trauma. The, their veins collapse. For some reason, RSD patients have poor veins. Their veins are hard to get hold of. Now, if you do a multiple sticks on them, you're now causing a barrage of signals into the central nervous system. You're now activating the central, the cent, you're causing more sensitization centrally. So usually I'll recommend my RSD patients to go on a chest port if they're on getting infusions or if they have pots and need to be on fluids on a more regular basis, it's worth getting a chest port. Any questions? <laughs>